We're talking about the wage structure of matter. For 3,000 years, everybody has thought that matter had to be little bits of sand, little particles, just like the Greeks thought. I think most scientists, they, they made sandcastles on the beach. Uh, when you make a sandcastle, you begin to think, well, this is the substance of which matter really is. So it was pretty hard for them to get rid of these ideas. But the truth of the matter is, all the experiments, the observations that scientists make, agrees that there has to be a wave structure of matter, and only wave structure. only wave structure. What's wrong with the particles? They just don't fit. Why? They don't match up with the observation. There's a thing called a wave-particle duality. And it's a big puzzle. Sometimes a particle looks like a wave, or at least what people think is a particle. They all tend to look like waves if they get small enough because they are waves. The photon, for example, energy goes from here over to here. Nobody sees it move, so they make up a particle called a photon. Never identified, and it violates all the laws of electricity and magnetism of which it is supposed to be made, but it isn't. So this is a great puzzle created by particle notions. Nobody explains it. It just happens. This is the, the religion of science. Nature is like the church. If you don't understand something, you just say it happens. Nature did it that way. And you stop thinking, stop looking for answers. The mathematical physicists are perhaps the most uh, deceptive of the lot because uh, they tend to pull the wool over everybody's eyes. They got all the A's in the algebra and calculus classes. All the rest of the scientists are kind of afraid of them. So they get to make more speculation than anybody else. What people think are particles are spherical wave structures consisting of an outgoing wave combined with a, an in wave. Mathematicians are fairly happy with this because these are the only two possible solutions of the equations. So that part is OK. Now the center of this structure behaves just like a particle. The only problem is not many people know it yet because not many people have investigated it. As far as I know, the only people is a guy in Australia named Jeff Hazelhurst and myself. And there's a few other people now are beginning to see it and they're looking into it. Space. Space is the, the medium of these waves. Space is the thing we still know least about. Space and its character and its structure is the research forefront of the future. Just because we can't see it, because we can't put our hand on it, we conclude it's really nothing. We have a phrase, empty space. All the logic of, of astronomy and physics tells you that it is not empty. It is a medium for the waves that go from you to me. Ten to the minus twelve. That is one millionth of a million meters. How many wave centers make up the construction of your body? Oh my gosh. Roughly. Roughly about uh, 10 to the 25, that is of one, followed by 25 zeros. How do you explain in the space going out into our universe where these in waves come from and where do the out waves go to? Well, at first sight, if you just consider one wave center and you imagine it got out waves and it got in waves, you're immediately puzzled, you know, because you, you say, well, gee, the out waves go on and on and on, and they get lost out there in infinity somewhere. And the in waves, you immediately say, where did they come from? But that a serious mistake was to think of it all alone. You must realize that the 
our universe is just filled with uh, wave centers. Every hydrogen atom, this pencil, wave centers everywhere. And so wave centers, uh, the waves go out and they interact with, with other wave centers. So there's a lot of exchange going on. Our out waves become their in waves because a wave is a wave. It yeah. has no tag on it saying, hello, I'm an in wave or I'm an out wave. It's just waves rippling through space. In waves, mathematically at least, have a somewhat different character than an out wave. Mm -hmm. So you simply can't switch them around. Yes, that's only relative to one particular wave center though. Once right. they're flowing back out, right. and they can become part of the in wave of another wave center somewhere else. Right, right. There's also another factor, uh, which is still mysterious, in that these these waves are exponentials uh, rather than sine waves. The solutions for the equations are e to the i omega t which is the same as cosine omega t plus i sine omega t. That is uh, the, the imaginary number square root of minus one. And uh, it's not quite clear what this does to it or how it uh, changes the character of the wave. Well, it seems to me, if you're saying that these particles are in fact spherical standing waves with a particle effect at their wave centre, that that's a very obvious explanation of the particle wave duality. Why isn't it obvious to everyone, and it hasn't been obvious for the last hundred years, that this is an obvious solution to describing matter in space? I think people, it's just creatures of habit. People get in the habit. It's hard to change. I just had a habit of thinking of particles. Exactly. Of particles. What did Einstein think matter was in his general relativity? Einstein, one of the most misunderstood people in the world. Yeah, uh, yeah. Everybody imagines Einstein as uh, declaring there are four dimensions and time goes backwards and frontwards and uh, nothing is the way you really see it. But no, he, he thought carefully and, and logically and almost came to all the right conclusions about uh, particles. He said they have to be expended. He realized that they have to interact with each other. You can't just say, it happens, nature made it that way. No, no, he realized that they have to be spherical, have the symmetry because there's no other symmetry that's possible. We live in a 3D universe. So what did he imagine? Instead of the particle, what did he think matter was? Oh, uh, unfortunately, he lived in the aftermath of a, a famous man called Maxwell. Maxwell was the man who wrote down equations uh, for radio waves before there were radio waves. And lo and behold, another guy named Hertz came along and discovered radio waves. Everybody said, gee, that's great. Maxwell must be right. And what did Maxwell use? What was he assuming existed to discover? He assumed there are electric waves. fields and magnetic fields, and these fields somehow go out from particles. And uh, they exist there, out, out around every particle, sort of like a halo of light. And uh, when another particle gets into the, the field of, uh, of another particle, they interact. One, they pull together or pull apart. And, uh, but the only problem is that these fields uh, don't respond to experiments that way. Apparently there are no uh, electric and magnetic fields. They're just a mathematical help. Very useful. They give you the right engineering answers. 
that the fields aren't real. So Einstein assumed that matter was a spatially extended field. Spherical. Right. So what's the difference between Einstein's view and your view of matter? And what are the similarities? Research in, uh, in energy transfer, and which is what we're talking about when we're talking about forces between particles, research in an energy transfer has shown that it is always quantum mechanics which gives the correct description. That is, one particle changes a quantum wave state, and for example, that might be a source, and somewhere, somewhere else, another particle changes its state exactly the opposite way. This one goes down a certain amount of energy, then this one will go up a certain amount of energy. Exactly, that's the conservation of energy. We, we realize that all energy is transferred in, in this way. It's one of the very important measurements to show that um, how the W coupled to um, its particles to produce a finite interaction. Forces between particles. Research in an energy transfer has shown that it is always quantum mechanics which gives the correct description. That is, one particle changes a quantum wave state, for example, that might be a source, and somewhere, somewhere else, another particle changes its state exactly the opposite way. Another particle changes its state exactly the opposite way. This one goes down a certain amount of energy, then this one will go up a certain amount of energy. Exactly, that's the conservation of energy. We, we realize that all energy is transferred in this way. A vessel for three quarks, and it is, they're so tightly bound that if you try to pull it apart, the little pieces of gluons that hold it together break apart and they produce more particles and more particles and more particles, but you never get free quarks. But anyway, the thought is that in initially in these experiments, there would be another size, another thing. The quarks would actually be composite particles and they would in turn be made out of subquarks. And there was a lot of theory, at least among some people, and a lot of excitement that maybe you could discover subquarks in these experiments. Well, E plus E minus annihilation at the Z pole actually was a whole set of very nice experiments. They were very precise experiments, and they verified the standard model. They were able, because of the high statistics and the good detectors and the cleanliness of electron positron scattering, they were able to measure many of the parameters of the standard model. For example, how how a, a bottom quark couples to a, a Z boson, how uh, how a charm quark couples, etc. That is the electron positron measurements produce the most precise value of the Weinberg angle. They produce the most precise value of the of the Z boson mass, and they continued at at uh, the the electron positron collider at CERN above the Z pole, and they were actually with sufficient energy to make um, charge W pairs, so they were able to make a W plus, uh, which is the mediator of the charge current interaction with its companion antiparticle, the W minus. And by measuring the threshold uh, behavior, the energy behavior of, of how strongly the electron and positron annihilate to produce this W pair, 
they could actually measure the curve and that curve was one of the very important measurements to show that um, how the W coupled to um, its particles to produce a finite interaction. Smallest space possible. Of course, the real world is a bit more complicated than this little circular dish. Uh, we don't know whether it has a circular boundary or not. Uh, that doesn't really matter. Uh, but the thing is, it is three-dimensional, not two-dimensional. So the wave structures are likely to be rather more complicated than this. However, we can understand that in a universe full of vibration, that centers can exist, which have particle-like properties, which will have different phases that can account or the different charges of different particles, but that these are standing waves and that the energy coming into each one and the energy going out of each one is the same energy that passes through the centre as the concentric waves converge on the spot and then go out. And that the arrangement of all of these different ones is supporting the phases of the waves of all other particles. Every particle in the universe is being constantly recreated by the energy of all other particles. This is something which is not really understood by physicists, and I think it's a very important point. If we want to understand how the universe works, we do need to say that nature actually works like this. Emotions is Gabriel Lafreniere, and he showed here how a wave is made from the incoming part, a standing wave, plus the outgoing part, these two components together make a standing wave, um, which, which you can see here. Uh, so it appears to just stand in space, but it's actually composed of the inwards and outwards waves. Of course, the outwards wave is just the inwards wave after it has passed through the center and comes out again of the spherical wave descending on a point. So this, this type of wave has the correct properties that we need to explain particles. If the particle is in motion, then the point at which it's converging has to be moving. So the, the waves are converging on a point and coming out from a point in opposite ways. So when you get the standing wave, you get this suddenly a strange effect where the wave that we saw before has superimposed on it these other bands of alternating phase. And these are the Broglie waves. All these calculations, as we had always managed to derive these calculations that show the de Broglie waves from this understanding of standing waves, but in this animation, uh, Gabriel has made it very clear uh, how these, what's actually going on. And the understanding of all of these things, it's clear that these are real waves. Real waves are happening that explain the, the nature of matter as being standing waves.
thought you just said magnet gravity wasn't magnetism. Well, magnetism and gravity are the same thing. You say magnetism is gravity, and you say gravity is magnetism. It doesn't matter which the hell you call which. They're both acceleration. They're both the complete opposite of force. They're dielectric acceleration. Smallest space possible. Smallest space possible. Smallest space possible. I thought you just said magnet gravity wasn't magnetism. Well, magnetism and gravity are the same thing. You say magnetism is gravity, and you say gravity is magnetism. It doesn't matter which the hell you call which. They're both acceleration. They're both the complete opposite of force. They're dielectric acceleration. Smallest space possible. Smallest space possible. I've made videos too. Um, most people don't know what happens when you smash a magnet. If you actually take a large disc magnet, which are kind of expensive, you don't really want to smash them. But I got lots of magnets that I've smashed and done things with. I mean, if you just keep if you just keep hammering it, a flat disc magnet, which all its constituent parts have field coherency. Do you know what happens when you smash it? It will fold, and then it will fold again. It will fold and keep folding and keep folding and keep folding, and keep folding until it creates the smallest spatial volume possible. Shit, that kind of sounds like the definition of gravity. Kind of like when you take a lot of matter, they will accelerate towards each other, and they will form a sphere. Uh, it only forms a sphere. Go ahead and take a disc magnet, hit it with a hammer, break it in two, hit it again, then hit it again, and then hit it again about ten more times. You will end up with a jagged little ball. Sphere. Ball. 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 I'm, I'm repeating the word ball for certain people out there that don't want me to say that word. Ball. Sphere. Of course, the real world is a bit more complicated than this little circular dish. Uh, we don't know whether it has a circular boundary or not. Uh, that doesn't really matter. Uh, but the thing is, it is three-dimensional, not two-dimensional. So the wave structures are likely to be rather more complicated than this. However, we can understand that in a universe full of vibration, that centers can exist, which have particle-like properties, which will have different phases that can account for the different charges of different particles, but that these are standing waves, and that the energy coming into each one and the energy going out of each one is the same energy that passes through the center as the concentric waves converge on the spot and then go out, and that the arrangement of all of these different ones is supporting the phases of the waves of all other particles. Every particle in the universe is being constantly recreated by the energy of all other particles. This is something which is not really understood by physicists, and I think it's a very important point if we want to understand how the universe works. We do need to say that nature actually works like this. One other thing that's not immediately obvious from the diagrams I did there 
is that the central wave has a slightly bigger wavelength than the outer ones. And this is because as the wave converges in the centre, there's a lot more energy at that point. And also, the amplitude of the wave goes up and down more. And water in a dish like this is the nonlinear medium. And that simply means that the wave speed is not constant at all times. It does depend on the depth. And in the real world, in the universe, the medium that the universe is made of, it has the same property that uh, where the energy gets concentrated at the centre of a wave, the speed of light will be altered. That's because the tension of the ether is changing at that point. And by that change, it means that the, the central waves are slightly larger than others. This leads to a, an in interesting situations, and the whole formation of particle properties uh, that comes about, all the different properties of particles that they have, such as spin and isospin and color, things, and all of these things that physicists have come up with, I think can all be explained by the different nature of the types of vibration you can get, particularly when you use a tensile medium rather than I did here, a fluid medium, because in a tensile medium, you can have the vibrations uh, crossways to the direction of travel of the waves. And this leads to very interesting configurations of spin and polarity uh, within each particle. One other consequence of this nonlinearity is that uh, it means that every individual wave is not 100% stable. Every wave, in fact, is always losing energy because the nonlinearity means that the wave shape is always changing. And this energy loss goes to harmonics of the wave. Uh, and it, we see this in a particular example of this is when a wave is breaking near the seashore. A wave that's traveled with a more or less sign-shaped wave, when it arrives near the seashore and the shore and the water gets less deep, the tops of the waves now travel faster than the bottoms of the waves and they overtake them and the wave breaks. And this complicated thing that happens when the wave breaks is, is something akin to what's going on near the centres of particles where a more complicated thing goes on and energy is lost to harmonics and other, other frequencies are given off or created within that particle. And this is how the whole universe arises. I am. That is my name forever and forever. And all generations must know me by this name. He will first display himself not by that name. He will display himself as power. True power would be that uh, three-pound lump of plutonium that sits in your hand like an innocent baseball. I mean, that is true power. That is uh, about the closest analogy I could draw. I have to kind of do that crooked there. Let's try, hard to draw a perfect circle freehand like this on the computer screen to get the hypertrochoidal pattern, but I, I think we get it now. So, anyway, thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, just click the link below. Anything to expand your mind. But this is the secret of Mother Nature, the conjugate nature of magnetism and dielectricity. Both are inextricably connected at the very core one, man magnetism is not something different than dielectricity. Magnetism would what we'd be calling, uh, would what we would uh, denotatively and ignorantly call force, but it's uh, not force. It is simply the loss of inertia that we understand to be dielectricity or the counterspatial pure energy of the nature of the universe. Its manifestation being force in motion, we therefore call it something else even though it is not something else. We call it magnetism, but there is not an autonomous uh, field modality known as magnetism. It is uh, simply a, uh, an expression of the loss of the potential of dielectricity, which must only and necessitatively form the geometry which we call magnetism, which is the creation of space and volume and force and motion. All of these are one and the same thing. That's the power as manifest, but not the power in true, which is completely unmanifest, necessitatively and logically so.
The Vesica Pisces image is a symbol of our unified Father slash Mother God as the two major aspects of the Supreme Creator with the cosmic womb of creation, the Vesica Piscis, in the center. The Vesica Piscis is a portal of light. It is the womb of creation and the source of unity consciousness. Creation consists of ever expanding, greater, intertwined circles, with the Vesica Piscis portal in between, which creates the flower of life symbol. The Vesica Piscis symbol creates a pathway between the spiritual AMD material worlds. Universal Father God slash Mother God White Portion, the Vesica Piscis, the Cosmic Womb for the Creator Sons the Co-Creator Sons and Daughters. Also the Cosmic Chalice from which the adamantine particles of Creator Light flow out into this universe via the Great Cosmic Rays. The Vesica Piscis the threefold flame and the violet flame of the seventh ray the age of the seventh ray and the violet flame acts as a trigger point for the initiation of our evolutionary ascension process, whereby the threefold flame of divine consciousness dramatically accelerates its direct influence upon the earth and humanity. As it accelerates, it spins or spirals upward in frequency, creating the merging into oneness of the blue and pink flames around the central golden flame. This spiraling action results in a blending of the pink and blue flames, creating the sacred violet fire a divine alchemy whereby all discordant or inharmonious energies can be transmuted or transformed into positive life force substance. This clearing is necessary so that we, the solar sons and daughters or the sons of light, may once again magnetize to us the adamantine particles of creator light via the radiance of our father slash mother god. The two intertwined circles create the symbol of our unified Father slash Mother God as the two prime aspects of the Supreme Creator, with the cosmic womb of creation, the Vesica Piscis, in the center. This symbol is encoded deep within our diamond core God cell, and when it is activated with adamantine particles of Creator light, it becomes a blazing threefold flame. Archangel Michael tells us that the ancient drawing of the threefold flame was appropriate for the time. Point A around point B, that makes a circle. But these two single points are clones, and those two points have equal potential. So not only can point A rotate around point B, but point B can also rotate around point A. This is one radius that both circles share. That black form in the middle there, that's called the Vesica Piscis, or the Vesica Pisces, depending on what you prefer. The Vesica Pisces is literally the womb of the universe. This is the whole essence of the universe. I'm not kidding. Sounds like a real crazy thing to say, but two circles of common radius and this shape in the middle that it makes called the Vesica Pisces is the whole root of sacred geometry. Literally every single thing that exists, and I'm not kidding, everything that exists 
springs out of this womb, this football-like shape. It sounds like a wild, improbable, crazy thing to say, but it's absolutely true. Everyone pretty much agrees. The universe is created by division. That ultimate mystery, that great creative force, which is the all, God mind, unity consciousness, that oneness divides and becomes duality and voila, the Big Bang. God-mind as single-pointedness divides and becomes duality and all relationship begins right there. And out of this relationship, of course, two circles of common radius and the Vesica Pisces. Vesica Pisces. So let's look a little closer at this Vesica Pisces, huh? Right there it is, that's it. When we get to four circles of common radius, which naturally evolve out of these points C and D, the Vesica Pisces is in the middle. But we have now five Vesica Pisces inside four circles of common radius. One, two, three, four, five. Ah, interesting. With the creation of those points C and D, we have, within the Vesica Pisces, a triangular situation. So we started with unity, we evolved into duality, and now we have an evolution to Trinity. This is the birthplace of trigonometry, an entire division of mathematics born in the Vesica Pisces. Huh? Those two points, C and D, bisect the Vesica Pisces and create the cross in the center and a new center, point X. So this introduces the transcendental nature of this pattern. It slips all the way into infinity and all the way out to infinity with smaller and smaller and smaller overlapping circles and larger and larger and larger overlapping circles all the way to infinity. So, you can't learn about the Vesica Pisces in a few minutes. This is an unbelievably deep and rich form, literally the womb of the universe. Everything that is springs out of the Vesica Pisces everything, all unfolding and spiraling and spiraling and spiraling into what we see as this manifest universe. We are sacred geometry. We spring right out of the Vesica Pisces. 
omnipresent principles of the universe. That is what sacred geometry is. And the Vesica Pisces, or the Vesica Pisces, is right in the heart of that. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Is I am. There is my name forever and forever. And all generations must know me by this name. He will first display himself not by that name. He will display himself as power. power would be that uh, three pound lump of plutonium that sits in your hand like an innocent baseball. I mean that is true power. That is uh, about the closest analogy I could draw. I just kind of drew that crooked there. Let's draw, hard to draw a perfect circle freehand like this on a computer screen to get the hypertrochoidal pattern, but I, I think we get it now. So anyway, thanks so much for watching. If you like these videos, click the link below. Anything to expand your mind. But this is the secret of Mother Nature, the conjugate nature of magnetism and dielectricity. Both are inextricably connected at the very core. One, man magnetism is not something different than dielectricity. Magnetism would what we'd be calling, uh, would what we would uh, denotatively and ignorantly call force, but... It's uh, not force, it is simply the loss of inertia that we understand to be dielectricity or the counterspatial pure energy of the nature of the universe. Its manifestation being force in motion, we therefore call it something else, even though it is not something else. We call it magnetism, but there is not an autonomous uh, field modality known as magnetism. It is uh, simply a, uh, an expression of the loss of the potential of dielectricity, which must only and necessitatively form the geometry which we call magnetism, which is the creation of space and volume and force and motion. All of these are one and the same thing. That's the power as manifest, but not the power in true, which is completely unmanifest, necessitatively and logically so. Is I am. That is my name forever and forever. And all generations must know me by this name. He will first display himself not by that name. He will display himself as power. Are constantly being moved, removed, or recreated by the neurons that carry them. This is captured very well by the aphorism Neurons that fire together, wire together And neurons that fire out of sync, fail to link The brain does not know the difference between what it sees in its environment and what it remembers Because the same specific neural nets are then firing We know physiologically that nerve cells that fire together, wire together if you practice something over and over again, those nerve cells have a long-term relationship. If you get angry on a daily basis, if you get frustrated on a daily basis, if you suffer on a daily basis, if you give reasons for the victimization in your life, you're rewiring and reintegrating that neural net on a daily basis, and that neural net now has a long-term relationship with all those other nerve cells called an identity. We also know that nerve cells that don't fire together no longer wire together. They lose their long-term relationship because every time we interrupt the thought process that produces a chemical response in the body, every time we interrupt it, those nerve cells that are connected to each other start breaking the long-term relationship.
There are many benefits to neuroplasticity. One, it enhances cognition and improves intelligence. Two, it protects against neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Three, it helps you to mitigate one of the signs of aging, which is impaired cognitive functioning. And four, neuroplasticity makes our brain adapt to the changes inflicted by damage, but it also causes adaptation to experiences and changes we may come across in the future. The key to increasing neuroplasticity is to cause some mild stress to the brain and force it to restructure its neural connections. The quintessential component to this is learning. Please explain briefly what you mean by the term extending the fulcrum. In my understanding, the fulcrum is the span that supports the seesaw. Do you mean by extension to make it higher? Or do you mean to make the seesaw lower, longer? I mean to make the extension a fulcrum of the seesaw. The fulcrum is there in nature always. The moment you express a desire to do something to make an action, then you extend from the fulcrum both ways. You make the seesaw. That's what it is, is to extend it, the amount of energy that you have. If you do not extend the fulcrum, you seemingly extend it. You seemingly divide its power. Because either boy, or children on either end of the seesaw can express the power of motion. But that is all they do, express the power of motion. And that power of motion they express is the power borrowed from the stillness of the falcon at the center. I do not always have to like to say it's a seeming extension because the universe is only seeming. Uh, perhaps if I use the word, it's a thought extension. And it is, it's an imagined extension. In your thinking, you imagine. And you cannot imagine without, you cannot imagine are objectively without creating motion objectively in your imagining. And so it is in the thinking process of nature there seems to be an extension or division which takes power or borrows seeming power without borrowing it, but seeming to, before I say it, the extension of power is like a person pulling away from the falcon with an elastic band that stretches and strains and makes it harder and harder and harder to pull away from it. But on the opposite side, as equal pulling, pulling away to balance that pulling. But the power is in the falcon. Not in the case. For if a man, if, for instance, if you, if you stood out on the prairie and pulled at a rope, you have no difficulty in pulling at that rope. It does not pull you back. But you hit your post there, and the post does not move. And you take an elastic band, and you hit it to it. And you stretch away from it. You find it pulling back. Therefore, you've created two conditions at the same time. You can bring it condition of extension, condition of extension and condition of expansion, and of, uh, of retraction. That's the action and reaction of nature. From the zero, you have extended in every direction, because you cannot extend this direction from the fulcrum without extending in the opposite direction to balance it. The two conditions of of decentration and concentration of mental thinking have been established in an 
in what we call an electric current. If you let that elastic go, it will go back to where it started from and disappear in the fulcrum. That fulcrum is the zero. That which we borrowed from the fulcrum is a multiplication of that zero plus and minus. One balancing the other, one offsetting the other. You borrow 50 from here, from there, by your pulling. 50 plus. On the opposite side of that is a 50 minus. 50 minus and 50 plus total together a zero. Nothing in nature ever exceeds zero. It seems to. And so we have a multiplied and multiple multiplying and dividing universe into pairs of opposite conditions of compression and expansion two opposite pressures which make it best possible to run our engines and do all the things we have and run the engine of our heartbeat and so forth. But the fulcrum of every never extension, every cease our motion, the fulcrum never moves. That is if zero and the elastic bands will pull together and disappear into the light from which it came, into the zero light from which it came to divide itself into two lights that will illumine the bodies that have extended corners. Those lights illumine and warm and heat and cool the bodies that are extended from it to make a universe like that. We make a universe that fits the imaginings of your mind. When it retracts back to that, there's no more want to want the bodies, no more light to light the bodies. The imagined universe disappears in so far as that one desire is concerned. Life has appeared and disappeared in death and it will again reappear. The extension of the fulcrum and its multiplication to a point of equal potential to that which is borrowed from the fulcrum is right with all of the effects that is created by so doing, the effects of warmth and heat and cool and growth and decay and moisture to make up this universe. But when that elastic band pulls that back into the bosom, there's an absolute disappearance of all it. The whole universe can't disappear at once because it isn't created that way. But that one that one pulsation will, in, will disappear and the pulsations which appear by extending the fulcrum and retracting those pulsations begin with an incredible speed, with an incredibly small duration. Frequencies of millions and millions of extensions and retractions The seesaw extent will be retracting so that its frequency is 186,000 miles a second. The frequency is growing larger, duration, accumulating, accumulating time until the frequencies are so slow that it gives you one in 50 years of a tree, perhaps. The ant, the elephant, the sun, the solar system. Multiplied time, multiplied frequency, multiplied abilities to accumulate these frequencies and wind them up to retard time for the sake of multiplying power. That's the level principle. 
That's the Falcon and the other principle. Drop in the lever. You lose time and you gain power. A man, by shortening the lever sufficiently and getting on the long end of it, can lift tons. Well, without that lever, he could only lift 100, 150 pounds with the lever and pulse of his own body. He's limited to that, but with the, as our committee said, give me a fulcrum and a lever long enough and I could move the universe. It's true. Does light bring spontaneous to nature? The college professor said it did not. Um, there is nothing spontaneous in nature in the sense that it is you. Everything in nature is planned. Everything in nature is the result of a desire to become, a desire to express in motion the idea of mind. Nothing spontaneous happens in your kitchen. In motion, the idea of mind. Nothing spontaneous happens in your kitchen after the dinner dishes have gone there. <laughs> A desire to reassort them is followed by action. And the fulfillment of your desire takes place by action. A word spontaneous is used often in the, na in the relation of combustion, spontaneous combustion. If you leave a pile of refuse out somewhere and some kindlings in it or, or even some decaying vegetation in earth that will burst into flame. That's not spontaneous combustion. That's the result of accumulated power, accumulated the power of decay. Baby universe, nine octaves. Gases begin in the first octave, very dense metals and the ninth octave, like the plutonium being the last of the natural last of the natural elements. So you have very few rings with gases. You start at hydrogen, one electron or whatever. They call it an electron. There's no such thing, but it's more of a ring. And that ring, in, uh, um, I kind of think like to use these words. There's a protonic force of inward motion or compression, a neutronic force, which is a point of reversal and then an electronic force which is the point of, of expansion back to stillness. So stillness compresses to a point and then expands in a reversal of direction back out to stillness. There's a protonic force of inward motion or compression, a neutronic force, which is a point of reversal, and then an electronic force, which is the point of, the, of expansion back to stillness. So stillness compresses to a point and then expands in a reversal of direction back out to stillness. 
And the way you can look at that too in, in nature is the breath. You breathe in, you start at zero, you breathe in, you stop at zero. Reverse direction and exhale out to do it again. So Walter's primary law is balance. If you need two words, rhythmic balance. If you need three words, rhythmic balance to interchange. And basically what that is is a series of repetitions that repeats eternally. So you have removed the need for the Big Bang. And this is basically a mind wave universe that rotates on the still white magnetic light. Anywhere you look, the center of any object is a point of gravity. Gravity is not an inward pulling force in Russell science. It is stillness, which divides into a north and south shaft upon which motion then rotates. So wherever there is a center of gravity, there is motion surrounding it. And that center of gravity can be likened to God. It's, it means the same thing pretty much. Gravity and God are one in that sense.
The word magnetism denotes a physical attribute. A proper way to connect it to the electric universe of motion would be to term it the magnetic electric universe, meaning the spiritual physical universe, or the mind thinking universe, in the sense that the zero magnetic universe is the creator and the motion universe is creation. When man is fully aware of the fact that he eternally lives in the Creator's invisible magnetic light as one with it and merely manifests life by action in the electric universe, he will then know that when action ceases, it merely ceases without affecting him, even as sound ceases without affecting him who made the sound. This is the construct. The Creator is the invisible, motionless, sexless, undivided, and unconditioned white magnetic light of omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent mind. The word magnetism denotes a physical attribute. A proper way to connect it to the electric universe of motion would be to term it the magnetic electric universe, meaning the spiritual physical universe, or the mind thinking universe, in the sense that the zero magnetic universe is the creator and the motion universe is creation. When man is fully aware of the fact that he eternally lives in the Creator's invisible magnetic light as one with it and merely manifests life by action in the electric universe, he will then know that when action ceases, it merely ceases without affecting him, even as sound ceases without affecting him who made the sound. This is the omniscient universe of eternal mind qualities, from which transient electric qualities emerge to simulate the qualities of the Creator's magnetic light of mind, which are knowledge, idea, energy, life, soul, love, truth, beauty, rhythm, balance, law, silence, rest, and stillness. The magnetic light is sexless, for it is in equilibrium. Its electric division into pairs creates the dual sex condition, which we know as male and female. The Creator gives of itself to all the universe in an eternity of endless regiving. The Creator's universe regives of itself to the Creator 
in an eternity of endless giving. That which the Creator gives is love. That which is regiven is love. That is the divine story of creation. It is a story of cause and effect in the giving and regiving of love. It is the one story of the Creator's knowing, expressed by thinking, illumined by the light of imagining. The time has come when unfolding intelligence in man should tell him that the divine spark of inspiration and the silent voice which speaks to him from within is the magnetic light of mind and the source of his energy. The Creator, who is the knower, is non-dimensional. The Creator's thinking is two-dimensional. The Creator's imaginings are three-dimensional. Creation consists of the invisible magnetic universe of mind, which man calls space, and the visible universe of motion, which man calls matter and substance. The Creator's still magnetic light is omnipresent and omnipotent. It is in and through everything, throughout eternity. The Creator's magnetic omniscience is expressed in the perfection of its electric creation. Knowledge is solely an attribute of the mind. Sensation is solely an attribute of the body. Mind is static light, the one and only power source of this universe. Thus thinking, you see what man calls life in a new light. You see it as the manner in which God manifests the idea of light and eternal life by dividing his one idea into countless pairs of many seemingly separate ideas for that is what vibrating light waves are. These waves of light emerge from their fulcrum zeros and disappear into them in endless repetitions forever and ever. The wave is an extension of heaven to earth and back again. The wave is a projection from the spiritual universe of rest to a resting point in the physical universe and back again to the spiritual universe for renewal of power to repeat the journey. Another way of saying it is that the wave is an emergence from the static condition of rest through the dynamic condition of motion to the static condition and back again, or that it is an extension of cause through effect and back again through effect to cause. Between every pulsation of movement, there is a period of stillness, which divides every compression expansion sequence. You can knowingly say that the power expressed in motion is not really in the motion, but is in the stillness, which divides motion. If that is true, life itself, which is presumed to be motion, must have its source in eternal rest. If death is presumed to be non-motion and life is dependent upon it to express life, the only possible conclusion is that life is two ways, both of which have their source in rest. The time will come in the unfoldment of man when his inner sensory perception will equal his outer sensory perception. When that time comes, he will know that motion only seems but has no existence. Present day man senses do not permit him to perceive the simultaneously voiding motion which cancels out the one they do see. In our new science of tomorrow teachings are these words for a new law for tomorrow which read, every action reaction in nature is voided as it occurs, is recorded as it's voided and is repeated as it is recorded.
The time has come when unfolding man should recognize this fact and place knowledge and power in the creator of universal bodies and not in the bodies. Be still and know. Minister for Science, William Degray, offered a bottle of vintage champagne to anyone who could explain the Higgs boson in simple terms. Nature does not, has not two different ways of creating anything. Created only by ways. There's nothing in the nature but waves of motion. Waves multiply in the direction of their amplitude and they divide on the way down. Back to silence of the, of the zero from which it came. That's life and death. All you have to do is look up into the heavens and look at a spiral galaxy and you'll see the exact same formation. In fact, every Every nucleal center is not exactly uh, a solid mass. There's only only one instance in the wave in which that's actually true, and that's at carbon, or what we call the wave amplitude. It's where the if you imagine a sinusoid, it's where the crest and the trough uh, is located. At that position, you've accumulated maximum potential by compression from the outside to the inside. And so it isn't a nuclear uh, mass in the way that they teach it, where all elements have a nuclear mass full of protons and neutrons of a certain weight with orbital electrons around it. What Russell is really endeavoring to teach us is that there's a wave structure behind all so-called particles or particulate. A particle mass is really only an accumulation of uh, waves in a smaller volume or smaller region of space and so it, it based on all of our test equipment and what we have available to us to our limited senses it appears to be a particle mass and that's what led to this whole this whole explosion of trying to describe everything using uh, particles but in reality it's it's the underlying mechanics behind everything is waves Everything has a wave structure because everything is created and it lives it has a life and death cycle. And that is fundamentally based upon the structure of the wave. Yes. So in and in the wave, of course, when things are, are moving through in waves and in wave fields, you constantly have this um this balance, right? And the balance, if I if I understand it correctly, the balance in nature uh is like moving through or well, this is a big question too, motion, but for, for all intents and purposes, I'll say moving through um, fields of space. So is that what we would call like a, a, a field perturbation? Nature does not has not two different ways of creating anything. Created only by waves. There's nothing in the nature but waves of motion. Waves multiply in the direction of their amplitude and they divide on the way down. Back to silence of the of the zero from which it came. That's life and death. And the resurrection on the other side of the equator when the 
same anode of the offspring reproduces itself again as another anode. And so fast we think of them as continuous. Because they're so fast. But there's a black gap of silence between these chromosomes. Every time it passes the zero zone point of the plane of silence from which it disappears, it's silent again. And it appears on the other side. The same silent tones accumulate, multiply into the A tone of the, the giraffe. So it is as well. And so fast we think of them as continuous. Because they're so fast. But there's a black gap of silence between these chromosomes. Every time it passes the, the zero zone point of the plane of silence from which it disappears, it's silent again. And it appears on the other side. The same silent tones accumulate, multiply into the A tone of the, the giraffe. So it is the same. <laughs>